Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. What a wonderful, wonderful day. A day to come together, to worship God, to be in one another's presence and fellowship and encouragement and admiration for all that you have done and we have done together. As we are, I don't know, coasting on this past week's turkey, and our veins are congealing with cranberry sauce and visions of next year's turducken dance in our head we come to the time each year where we do a little bit of review about the church here at West Hill I always like to go back and look over the headlines of the year gone by what has happened in the world and what is happening here in Corsicana and specifically what is happening in the church here but I want to do things a little bit differently because if you go back and you look over the headlines here's what you will find you'll find that there were some politicians that told the truth and some politicians that lied you look at the economy and you'll see that it sometimes it was up and sometimes it was down someone won the Super Bowl someone won the World Series someone won the Heisman Trophy someone I think even won the NBA championship if anyone cares on those things the headlines are always going to be there. The news stories are going to basically be the same from year to year. We might change a word here, and we might change a team there, but our most important headlines don't come from the news of economy or the news of politics or the news of sports and entertainment. The most important headlines come from the church. They come from the spiritual well-being of Christians and their relationship with God. They come from the fact that there is in heaven a book, a book of such size and joy and happiness. For it is the Lamb's book of life, and on that great day, that book will be opened, and those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be the ones that are called home for an eternal home in heaven. Come, thou blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom which was prepared for you from the foundations of the world. The Lamb's book of life and the headlines ought to read, this name was written there today. And we can say that here at West Hill that we've had some 20 names or so written in the Lamb's book of life from here. But the headlines go past the numbers and the statistics to a question we might ask is the story of West Hill, if we were to give West Hill a headline today, would it be or could it be that the West Hill Church of Christ is the church of the first century? Could we read a story about how West Hill existed in the first century? That's what we want to look at today. You know, through the ages, we have seen this concept of a restoration plea heard over and over again. It is a time to leave behind personal preferences, denominational dogmas, and rebuild the church from the New Testament. As if there is no church in existence whatsoever, all we have is a blueprint. A blueprint that is detailed. That is, that is detailed in, in, in every aspect and is, is broad in its scope to, to include the entirety of the world. A blueprint that each one of us has the training and architectural know-how to go to that blueprint and rebuild the church of the New Testament. I know there are those who think that that concept in itself is fanciful. Oh, that can't happen. Well, which church are you going to restore? The church at Corinth? with its problems concerning worship, with its misunderstanding and misapplication of the miracles? Are you going to restore the churches of Galatia that are struggling with, with the infiltration of Jewish doctrine? Are you going to uh, uh, restore the church at Ephesus that had forgotten its first love and had left its first love and, and had a reputation of being alive but was in fact dying? Are you going to restore the church at Laodicea that had succumbed to lukewarmness and made God sick? Which, which one are you going to restore, someone might say. But you know, the fallacy and the foolishness of that question is a misunderstanding that we know about the church at Galatia because Paul writes a letter to them telling them how to correct 
the problems at Galatia and become the instituted church. We know the problems at Corinth because Paul writes the church at Corinth to correct the problems at Corinth so that they may once again be the church which God designed. We know that Ephesus left their first love because they were challenged to return to their first love and be that church. And so by taking the scope of the New Testament and each of these different congregations and recognizing the, the problems that they struggled with according to the apostle, leaving those out and putting in the corrections, we can restore the New Testament church from the ground up. There's just a few principles that we begin with. I, I think the first thing we understand is that we must speak as the oracles of God, meaning that we must allow the Bible and the Bible only to control us and guide us in this endeavor. No matter what age it is, 21st century, 20th century, 19th, 18th, 1st century, it makes no difference. If the Bible alone becomes our guide, we cannot defer to personal feelings or our own sense of personal justice. We go by what does the Bible say. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11 tells us to speak as the oracles of God. God has not been silent in this matter. God has boomed from heaven a thundering voice to tell us, here is how I designed it. Here is what I want you to be. And if we allow that to undergird all of our mission, all of our rebuilding efforts, all of our restoration efforts, we come to a second principle, that is we must speak the same thing in every church as the apostles did in the first century. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17 trying to agree, as some do, on, on one or two dominant principles and then leaving the rest up to human preferences or cultural trends, that robs the church of its effectiveness. Every church can and must speak the same thing. Again, the Bible alone. It has often been termed sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. And it's how we live. A third principle to help us in rebuilding the church to see if West Hill is in fact the church of the first century. We must base our unity on what is spoken, not on what is ignored. We cannot succumb to the carnal mantra of unity and diversity. Unity and diversity. As if that in itself is the message God wants for us. Rather, we must stand firm in the revealed truth. We can be unified on what the Bible says by reading it, and studying it, meditating upon it, and accepting the love of truth in our heart. Despite anyone's attitude toward it or ignorance of it, truth will remain truth. I may not like it. I may not know it. It may make me angry, but it's still true. And so, this morning I want to take this idea of a restoration mindset. I want to look at how the church here at West Hill over the past year and going into the future measures up to this restoration plea. Are we the same church as the first century? Do we look like ancient saints we want to do this by looking at a portrait of the church in the New Testament and see how we fare. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 42 and go to the end of the chapter. And what has happened is the first gospel sermon has been preached. Peter has stood up. He has defended his compadres. They have preached the gospel. He has challenged them. This Jesus, whom you have crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. He is the one. He is the chosen one. He is the principal one, the only one through whom we can have salvation. You have crucified him. They are cut to their hearts. Men and brethren, what must we do? And the gospel is told to them that they are to repent and be baptized, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of their sins, that they may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Many other words, it goes on, he said, and taught them. And those that received his word, in verse 41, 
were baptized. The church explodes onto the scene. There were those who had been prepared during the ministry of Christ who were waiting for this moment, this day of salvation, as the old prophets referred to, this day of Pentecost. And what was only a plan in the mind of God started its building process on that day and in that moment. In verses 42 through 47 then, Luke writes for us a synopsis of this first church, the Jerusalem Church of Christ. He, he writes for us this synopsis. Here's, here's what it looks like. Here's what they were doing. Here is the church in its infancy, its purity, its pristine nature. At this point, unadulterated. At this point, unchanged and unchallenged. At this point, it is just the institution of the church. And what it looks like. Let's begin in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. All came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It's simple, really. If we can look and understand this portrait of the church, and we can look at what we do here at West Hill, we can see, have we successfully mimicked the first century church? And the first thing we see is worship. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. This has long been understood to be worship of the first century church. Here the Jerusalem Church of Christ is committed to regular worship services where they are saturated in the teaching of the doctrine of the, or, or, of the apostles as delivered by the apostles. Of course, they receive theirs from heaven through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit inspiring them and giving them direct revelation. They were able to teach that doctrine that doctrine or that teaching, what was expounded to them, was saturated in the first century church. It was the undergirding, the underpinning of the entirety of the church. It was the information that mankind needed in order to come to a relationship with God. You take away this information, you take out this knowledge and take out this wisdom, and man does not know how to respond to a creator who loved us so much. Not only was the church and its worship saturated in the teaching of the apostles, but it says that they also engaged in fellowship. The word fellowship, koinonia, to, to join in a, a, a sharing participation of the work. Paul uses the same work or our same word in reference to the, uh, the contribution for the, the relief efforts uh, for the famine in Jerusalem and Judea. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 4, that their fellowship, that their, their joint partnership in giving this contribution to alleviate their needs. And so there is a close connection between fellowship and the contribution of the Lord's day. There is also a joint participation in the singing that we offer to God as a fruit of the lips. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Not only is it a fruit of the lips, but it is a, a common joint participation, speaking unto yourselves or speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So there is a joint participation in the act and worship of singing. So in these two, uh, the contribution and singing, we see them coming together in the fellowship of the first century church. Thirdly, though, we see that the first century church also in, in, uh, uh, partook of the Lord's Supper through the breaking of bread. The Lord's Supper being the, the time in which the memorial of Christ sacrificed 
is meditated upon and, and entered into through the eating of unleavened bread and the drinking of, of unfermented wine. And finally, it says their worship included their prayers, their petitions and intercessions toward God on behalf of one another, on behalf of their friends and their community, on behalf of the church. That's worship. That's worship in the first century. And here we are almost 2,000 years later and the West Hill Church of Christ looks like the Jerusalem Church of Christ of the first century. A lot of people who, who have once held to the pattern of the first century have changed their worship. It seems like uh, the changing of the worship to f fit the mood of the day is a trend in our culture. So when a congregation of saints holds tightly to the pattern of worship, that's important. That's a headline. 21st century church worships like the 1st century church. They're a portrait of one and the same. That's a headline. Not who won the Super Bowl. Secondly, we see their attitudes toward God in verse 43. All came up on every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now we understand and know that this was a time of miraculous age when God was working miracles directly through the apostles and they were passing that on through the laying on of their hands, Acts chapter 8 and verse 18, to those that were being saved in the first century. But, but notice all of this brings about the same thing that we have today. Awe, respect, and reverence toward God. The attitude of the old church was one of fear for God in heaven. Reverence for God and His eternal principles. What was it that Solomon would write years before this, establishing that eternal principle of Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13? The end of the matter. Here's, here's the end, the summary of the whole thing. All has been heard. And here it is. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The example reaches even to the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit which they were told, do not eat of that fruit, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God comes into the garden and He says, where are you, Adam? And what happens? They hide. We were afraid. Fear for the, the power of God. Fear for the, 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 uh, the reverence of God. For the creator of the universe to speak a word. Let there be light. And light exists. Can speak the same condemnation of an existing man. Let him be cursed. And man would be cursed. And so there was a, a reverence for God, awe for God. The Creator deserves our respect. Respect for His will, respect for His word, respect for His power. That's what the first century looked like. And so we step back to the 21st century. Does West Hill resemble that first century church? I think it does not have to, uh, one does not have to visit long here at West Hill before they recognize our overarching respect for God. A respect for His Word in which it becomes the foundation of all that we do. It is followed, it is studied, it undergirds our work and our service toward Him. Our petitions, often in prayer, reflect this reverence toward God. When we hear people say things like, May our worship be pleasing to you, Father. You see, in that, there's an attitude that we want to please God. Or, sometimes you'll hear see people pray, Help us follow your will, Heavenly Father. Because we understand that's what we want. We have a respect for God and His will that we want to follow after it. In an age of the cult of personality and celebrity worship, where, where athletes and politicians have, have, have become so admired and followed and pined over that praise and adoration toward God is almost forgotten. It becomes headline news for a group of Christians. 
to fear God and keep His commandments. Notice verse 44 and 45. Benevolence. All who believed were together had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as many as had need. The first century church exhibited concern for one another's needs. They shared their wealth with one another, even when it meant, even when it meant selling things that were dear and precious to themselves. They sold those possessions so that they may share with those who were less fortunate. What's amazing is we see this example of the church in Jerusalem giving up and sacrificing for one another to share with one another. And it's just a few years later, maybe 15 years later, when famine hits the region of Judea. And these very same Christians, the Christians in Jerusalem, who had plenty and gave it up for one another 15 years ago, were now in need to receive help from others. The church's collective heart again was opened. Open to them and their poverty and their famine and their destitution was met by congregations in other parts of the world. The church ought to be seen as a hallmark of sensitivity to the, those who are poor, to those who are underprivileged, to those who are hurting and those who are struggling. It's the way the first century church was. Throughout this year, and many years previous, West Hill has opened its heart and its hands to those who are in the church and in the community. We have striven hard to be sensitive to the, to the needs of other people, to those who are struggling, either within this congregation or in other churches or, or, or even in the community at large. The church has distributed food and money and aid and personal help to hundreds of people in Corsicana. And through the continued support of each saint here, we will continue this good work of benevolence like the first century church on into the future as we continue to meet the mission which God has given to us. There's another headline for you. Church keeps light shining for many. That's exactly what we do. It's not a way to boast. It's simply to say that we can accomplish great things together. To help those who don't have enough. Those that won't put food on their table can put food on their table this week. Because we were there. Those that couldn't take a shower because they had no running water can have a shower. Can have a hot shower because not only did we help with water, we've helped with electricity. They can get their medications. Because someone stepped in and helped them pay for their, their medications. You see, that's the first century, working in the heart of the 21st century. I like verse, verse 46. The church in this portrait is seen as being involved in one another's lives. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. The breaking of bread here is the generic having a, a common meal. They had one another over in their homes. It is the idea of Christian hospitality. They went into the streets of Jerusalem, into the courtyard of the temple, and taught the gospel together, giving one another support and encouragement. You know, sometimes we think that, that we've got to teach the gospel alone. You know, it's one-on-one. -on -one. We hear that a lot. One-on-one. -on -one. Uh, let's send that person alone into the world and try to, try to change the world one person at a time. When in actuality, what the first century church did was went as a team into the communities. And they challenged people in the public places and in private places because they were together. They were involved in one another's life. Think about this. In the previous verses where they were giving to those who had need, how did they know who needed? They were involved in one another's lives. They shared a common concern for one another. And we see, again, West Hill looks very much like the church of the first century. Christian hospitality is alive and well with many here in the congregation. In times of sorrow or joy, we have shared with one another. Nobody has, to have, has been made to face death or sickness or trial alone. Every time it is known, there are Christians 
Maybe a handful this time, and maybe a different handful another time, but there are Christians who come to their aid, who rally around and support, and care and concern. It has been a, a hallmark of this congregation for generations to be involved in one another's life. In a dog-eat-dog -dog world, looking out for number one, it is heartwarming to hear of Christian concern and care winning out over personal prosperity. Here's your headline. Christians are involved with one another. And then finally, evangelism. Look at verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all people, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. An important part of the church's mission in the first century was evangelism. It was God's design, an intended way of seeking and saving the lost. Hence the church becomes the linchpin in God's scheme of redemption. You remove the linchpin and the machinery falls apart. The church at Jerusalem took this task seriously and drew many souls to God. Think about in Acts chapter 2, we know that 3,000 souls were added to the church in that day. A few weeks later, by the time we roll to Acts chapter 4, there's another thousand souls in the church. Why? It's because their evangelistic zeal spread quickly. It burst out of the borders of the city and into the region around them, eventually going into the whole world just as Christ had predicted in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 when He told them, You will receive power when the, uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The result of the early church's efforts was the world was turned upside down. In Acts 17 and verse 6, it says that they, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. West Hill continues to take up this mission. Many individuals in this congregation engage their friends and relatives on a regular basis with the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's saving power. And as a result, people are coming out of darkness and coming to God, leaving their sins and having their guilt removed. And like the church in the first century, God continues to add those who are being saved to His church. Here's your headline. Corsicana turned upside down. Each generation of the church must examine itself in light of the Bible. All Scripture, it says, is inspired of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I think we can safely go back and, and, and from the teaching of the entirety of the New Testament say that the same truth holds true for the church. That the church of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Because we've examined ourselves by the Scriptures. West Hill has a, a proven track record of following the pattern of the first century. As a result, it is the same church. West Hill existed in the first century because the character of what we do here every day, every week, every month, every year is the same character that, that was the portrait of the church in the first century. And as we prepare for 2014, let us, let us strive to keep alive our adherence and our guidance by the Word of God. Let us continue to be, what, a lighthouse to the world. A lighthouse on the shores of salvation that draws those who are weak and those who are sinking and those who are storm-tossed and those who are lost to bring them to the harbor of safety in God's hands. You know, we have a, a solid, solid foundation. We have wonderful resources with which to work. And this is because we, His saints, have sought to be the church of the first century.
There's another headline that concerns me, though. And it's your headline. It's us as an individual. Have we allowed that gospel, that goodness of God, to penetrate our hard outer shell, to soften our heart, and to come toward God? You know, there are some here today who are lost, that are outside of salvation. Maybe your faith is holding uh, uh, tenuously by a small thread, or maybe you've never obeyed the gospel, but you're in the same predicament. You are outside of fellowship with God, but, but today your headline can read, Today she was saved. This was the day he obeyed the gospel. Baptized for the remission of your sins, drawn back into fellowship with God. What will your headline read today? If you're ready for salvation, we beg you to come while we stand and while we sing.